This video is complementary to the video I did a couple days ago about the left QL, about why your left QL might hurt. And in it, I mention how I never really treat a left QL. The QL is just a victim of instability and dysfunctional breathing that's occurring elsewhere in the body. So the QL becomes overused in one sense to help stabilize the left side of the pelvis, but it also becomes uh, just over pulled, like it's constantly being aggravated because we can never actually fully, fully get our weight to that left side. I, in my initial video, what I, what I wanted to do uh, as I planned the video out the day before was actually something diff completely different than what the video turned into. But now I want to go back to the original source of my idea for the left QL is these two pictures that I'm going to show. And what you're going to see is a dissection of the frontal, of the deep frontal line. These are two pictures from it. You can find the video itself. And if you want to really understand what the heck I'm talking about and what the hell PRI is talking about and the interconnecting, interconnecting, can't even say the word, interconnectedness of the body, watch this video. Because a couple weeks ago, uh, someone I was just consulting with, he, he, he asked me one time, he said, you know, I had this really weird experience that when I, when I, thought, when I read about tongue posture, and where to put my tongue, he did that, and he felt his hip flexors turn off. And he said, wasn't that weird? And I said, no, it's not weird. Let me show it, let me send you this video and you'll see why it's not weird. And what you'll see in these pictures is that, uh, and if you watch the video, the, the surgeon is commenting on all these connections and it starts from the foot, from the bottom surface of the foot. It's connected. Everything is going to be connected through the calf, through the through the back the back of the knee, through the the quadricep muscle, into the then he goes to the iliacus muscle. He shows how the iliacus connects to the left QL and what's the iliacus part of the iliopsoas. So the iliacus and the psoas function uh, very similarly, and they insert into a common tendon. And obviously, their muscles fibers actually converge to become one muscle as it approaches the femur. Uh, and of course, the psoas approaches, uh, attaches to the diaphragm. And what, that's what you're seeing in these pictures. The, the left QL, the left QL itself, this is what the guy says, the left QL itself actually connects to the left diaphragm. So addressing a left QL is not going to change anything until you change the, the, the function of the diaphragm, which means you have to get that left ZOA, uh, which is the proper position of the pelvis and the rib cage on that left side for the diaphragm to be able to go back into its dome shape so it can start to, to pump. If the pelvis stays forward in a left AIC pattern and a rib cage on the left stays elevated in a right BC pattern, you're not getting that closure, that compression that allows the diaphragm to go back into a domed shape. Remember, the diaphragm depends upon the position of the pelvis and the rib cage for its function. If those two are further apart, the diaphragm becomes more uh, diagonal. This is in the literature, but it's what you'll find all the time. And you can, this, these are in studies. I don't have the names. I've read them all years ago, but they're there. This is not a PRI concept. On that left side, that left diaphragm becomes more of a postural stabilizer, while the right side retains its ability to pump as a breathing muscle. At any rate, what you'll find uh, is that not only does it stop the diaphragm, the, it, the diaphragm then becomes, uh, is completely connected to the heart and also the whole front of the chest and the neck. So the hyoid muscles, the, all these anterior neck muscles that get tight on people. So here's the hyoid bone. You have the hyoid muscles, I guess the inferior hy hyoid muscles and the superior. So all these muscles that go up underneath the chin uh, the trachea, uh, so all of those muscles from the bottom of the foot up to the neck are connected through this deep front line. And oh, and it terminates with the tongue, okay? And, and the muscles that move the tongue. The tongue is a big deal. Uh, you'll have better results treating a tongue to, to get that QL to relax. <laughs> so the tongue is... You know, if the t and this is why a lot of people who don't have space for their tongue 
They're thrusters with the tongue. They thrust their tongue. They don't have space for it to sit at the roof of the mouth behind the front top teeth. Uh, when there's not enough space for the tongue, the tongue will probably stay tense. And as you can see through this connection, you'll have tension all the way down the front, all the way to the hip flexors and the feet. Your plantar fasciitis could be an issue with the tongue because when something is restricted, tension will be felt all the way along that line. That goes for all these other lines also. So if you, if you are into Thomas Meyer's anatomy trains, it's the same issue. Uh, now, but this also shows why it's absurd to try to treat a foot issue only by, you know, working the foot, working on pronation of a foot. What the hell is that gonna do? Everything that we do with our body has a relationship to elsewhere in the body. So pronation and supination of that foot, if that's what you work on, well, what if the issue is that the tongue doesn't have enough space or the person doesn't even know where tongue posture should be or has a forward head posture and now that tenses up the entire front line, he can't get his hip flexor to turn off and you're working on a foot? Do you wanna work on isolated areas of the body when we just saw this and you can see this complete interconnectedness or would you rather do techniques that restore your body's ability to move all at once in the proper sequencing, which is what PRI does. Uh, that's why you can get necks to relax just by having them sense things underneath their feet differently because it's all connected. If you lose ground sense, if your brain can no longer perceive uh, the, the, the ground underneath your left heel or the right arch, which are the two big ones, how are you ever gonna get that left QL to turn off? How are you ever gonna get the neck to relax? When I get someone and, I'm and I check their neck and their neck can't bend to the right, it can bend to the left, but cannot bend to the right. All generally, as long as there's nothing you know, going on up here, all I have to do is get them to sense the ground underneath the left foot. Why? Because the whole body switches its position and all of a sudden it has all this neck movement that it didn't have because you didn't realize or people don't realize when they're looking at ranges of motion, they think these people are straight. They're not, they're oriented to the right. And in that position, if a body is living oriented to the right, which is the left AIC, right BC, right TMCC patterns, if this person is, limit, is over on that right leg when, or is oriented to the right when they're lying on the table, you think you're looking at them straight, but in reality, you're just looking at a, uh, the compensations. You're looking at them twisting to stay straight. You're not seeing what the orientation of the body is underneath, and that's why their ranges of motion are limited. They don't have limitations. Stretching them will be pointless. Trying to you know, manipulate their neck will be pointless. They're just stuck in a position. Turn them to the left. Oh, and that neck will, will bend to the right just fine. Get them to feel their left heel. Compress the left side. Watch how my neck bends. Bends to the left. Bends to the right. Am I moving my neck? Or am I moving my torso underneath my neck? It's the rotation of the torso in frontal plane and transverse plane as we're moving that lets the neck relax. We don't walk going like this. It's this. This is how you alternate a neck. My neck is bending because my body compresses and decompresses. I don't twist my neck. So uh, that was the original video that I want. That was my original left QL idea. I just want you to see the interconnectedness of all of these things and why this gentleman found that his hip flexors relaxed when he put his tongue in the proper place um, and why treating one area of the body is almost in my mind useless because you don't know working on one part of the body will not necessarily. So if I have someone stand on their left leg, I mean, they have most of their weight on their left leg. Their right foot's still on the floor. But if I do that and their knee is locked out, whatever I just said won't work. That neck will not relax. Why? Because they're an extension. You have to put them in left stance properly, which I know how to do because it took me years and years to understand how this all comes together. But if they're in left stance properly, that neck has to relax unless they're being held by something up in the cranium, like no space for their tongue. Uh, the maxilla hasn't expanded enough, the jaw's too far back, or the, they have an underbite, an overbite, a crossbite, whatever it's gonna be. If there's something structural there, then yeah, what I just said probably won't work. But if they don't have anything structural impeding 
that process from happening, then it's just a matter of inhibiting a pattern, turning off an over-dominant pattern, that left AIC, right BC, right TMCC pattern. And when you put them on their left leg, now their brain can actually sense proper grounding, proper space, proper compression, and it can relax, it can relax. And that's how that works. So I hope that was um, beneficial in some way.